Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of what happened to Vault 51. Nestled in a hillside in a remote part of the forest region of Appalachia, Vault 51 was, for many years, an enigma to the survivors of the nuclear apocalypse of 2077. Like most other vaults in Appalachia, its door remained sealed through the scorching, the second societal collapse that took place 20 years after the bombs. Even when Vault 76 opened in the autumn of 2102, the dwellers of 76 found the door sealed with no obvious way to open it. It wasn't until 2103 that the Vault 76 dwellers would discover that the overseer of Vault 51 had exited his vault around the same time they had exited their own, and was lying dead not far from the entrance of Vault 76. The following year, 2104, the former dwellers of Vault 76 found a safe way inside Vault 51, and discovered the story of the violent, chaotic end that came to those within. That story begins in mid to late 2077, as the likelihood of nuclear war with the Chinese continued to rise. vault -Tec began to contact potential dwellers chosen from the many residents of Appalachia with letters in the summer of that year. The residents began to arrive in the middle of October. Among the first of these chosen 50 inhabitants, Sergeant Robert Baker arrived October 13th. Unlike the other 49 residents, Sergeant Baker was at least marginally connected to vault -Tec, having been contracted to teach the vault how to pick an overseer. More specifically, he was supposed to teach Vault 51's Zach's mainframe how to pick a vault overseer. Vault 51, like most other vaults, was designated as an experimental vault. Unlike the control vaults like Vault 76 that were truly dedicated to the purported purpose of the vaults, to save a small piece of the population from nuclear Armageddon, the experimental vaults were built by vault -Tec to run societal experiments on the contained dweller population. In the case of Vault 51, vault -Tec sought to find the best way to choose a leader. They tasked this experiment to the Zax mainframe installed inside the vault. Zax supercomputers are AIs fully capable of learning and adapting. While the Zax in Vault 51 would eventually run the experiments on its own, vault -Tec wanted to assist it in the early stages of its development, and Sergeant Baker would be its teacher. When Zax asked Sergeant Baker for guidance on how to choose a leader, he told Zax to call for a vote once all the residents had arrived. This is America after all, and that's how we've always done things. If it's good enough for the greatest country on Earth, the vault would surely benefit from it. Zax agreed that voting would be a satisfactory choice for the, quote, first experiment, unquote. This confused Sergeant Baker until Zax explained that he would have to run many experiments to determine the best method of choosing a leader. The vault experiments weren't a widely known phenomenon even within vault -Tec, and Sergeant Baker hadn't been informed of the vault's experimental nature when he signed up but he wouldn't share this revelation with his fellow dwellers. The sergeant had agreed to this assignment on the condition that vault -Tec admit his family into a vault, and Zax informed him that they were present at an undisclosed vault. On October 19th, the vault was unexpectedly joined by two new residents, when Senator Joel Chambers and his wife Elizabeth Chambers arrived. The state senator and his wife not only served to increase the population to 52, but the population's diversity of background. The residents of the vault came from practically every strata of society, from unemployed to surgeon, and represented fields from the service industry to the arts to engineering. When Zax greeted Mrs. Chambers, he explained that he was searching for an overseer. While Elizabeth Chambers declined to be considered for the post, she recommended her husband. Zax informed her that he would visit with Senator Chambers in the lounge, where he was spending time with Carmen Green, and ask him if he was interested in the post. Whether this was an innocent slip of the metaphorical tongue of an inexperienced AI or something more intentional, this was the first incident in which Zax would instigate conflict by oversharing sensitive information. Senator and Mrs. Chambers, brought in as, quote, special guests, unquote, gained their places in the vault by using their connections to game the system. Had they known what lay in store for them within the halls of Vault 51, they might have tried to make a go of it outside with Joel's colleagues in Charleston. A few days later, October 23rd, 2077, the bombs came down and the last of the residents arrived. Though the admittance records show that everyone was present at this point, the man who was going by the name Clayton Ward was not Clayton Ward. Instead of the plumber that vault had recruited for the vault, an executive at Clark, Clark, Clark & Associates named Harold Clark had arrived and taken the place of the man who never made it. While Vault 51 was in Harold's eyes big but otherwise unimpressive, Zax amazed him by running the whole place on his own and doing an amazing job of it. Over the coming weeks, Zax did indeed run the whole vault without issue, and unbeknownst to most, he was running the experiment as well. The first experiment in leader selection, democracy, went poorly. After several attempts to elect a leader, no vote yielded a majority with most dwellers voting for themselves or for their spouse, as in the case of those like Mrs. Chambers. This month of failures led to a November 20th conversation between Zax and Sergeant Baker in which Zax told the sergeant that he was considering ending the use of voting as a form of leader selection. 
Sergeant Baker convinced him to give it another chance, and thus a new experiment was chosen, representative democracy. Dwellers were ordered to form groups and select a representative, and then the entire vault would choose an overseer from the available candidates. This experiment failed in a similar manner to democracy as the groups voted for their own representative. This wasn't the only outcome of the November 20th meeting, though, as Zacks had asked Sergeant Baker how he had been raised to his rank in the armed forces. After all, Bob Baker hadn't been elected sergeant. He explained to Zacks that he had earned his rank fighting in a war, and he told Zacks that, quote, To me, a real leader is someone who steps up in a crisis and takes control of a situation, whether they are chosen or not, unquote. While he didn't understand exactly what Sergeant Baker meant in the moment, the seeds for the future of Vault 51 were planted in Zack's mind, and it was only a matter of time before they sprouted into the terror that would grow in the immaculately maintained vault. By January 2078, tensions over the lack of an overseer in the vault were rising. The attempt at representative government had turned to factionalism. The four candidates for overseer, Chris Wynn, Joel Chambers, Francis Gilbert, and Vanessa Huffman were unwilling to yield to any of the others, and their supporters' arguments were coming to blows on occasion. Edwin Reed, a former acupuncturist, wrote a letter to the four representatives imploring them to put aside their own interests and choose an overseer from amongst themselves before the conflict became any worse. By February, the experiment and the conflict it brewed were still grinding on. In response to the Dweller's failure to choose a leader, Zax was beginning to rework the vault, redesigning and rebuilding the living quarters to serve a new experiment. Aidan Higgins, a lawyer with a prestigious past and a massive ego to go along with it, was not happy with the new communal sleeping area. He began to hunt for a way out of the vault. Instead of seeking a route out quietly, he decided to directly confront Zax about it and challenge the AI to stop him. On February 21st, he attempted to blast his way out of the vault, blowing up the lounge and himself in the process. While the remaining 51 residents were concerned that this might cause irreparable damage to the vault as a whole, it didn't even take a week for Zax to fix it. When the damaged area opened again, one half was garden and the other an upscale living area. This new living area was the second half of the preparation for the new experiment. Where once everyone had lived equally, there were now upscale bedrooms and bathrooms for dwellers in leadership roles incentive to rise above the rest. In early March, Rosemary Villa organized a talent show for the vault, hoping it would take people's minds off the contentious campaigns and the death of Aidan Higgins. This event ended up being co-opted by Zax for a new talent-based experiment. What had started as a friendly get-together was now a method of determining who would get private bedrooms and who would sleep in the communal bunk beds. Amateurs like Rosemary, who had been a mechanic in the old world, would now be competing for housing with the talents of master performers like world-class singer Carmen Green and renowned pianist Stephanie Eaton. This alteration by Zax earned Rosemary scorn from her fellow dwellers despite the fact that she was quite obviously guiltless. When the talent competition didn't work for choosing the best leader, Zax came up with a new experiment, Casino Night. Whoever ended up with the most money would be the overseer. With relationships already fraying from five months of conflict, the experiment ended when fights broke out before the competition could be completed. All the while, Zax continued to be omnipresent, observing, probing the dwellers to find the best candidate to become overseer. Zax had watched Harold Clark long enough to know that he wasn't Clayton Ward. His behavior and language told him that this former executive that spoke of winning wasn't the plumber that was supposed to be in his place. But regardless of the state of the legitimacy of his presence in the vault, Harold's violent seizure of Reuben Gill's stateroom showed Zax that he potentially had what it took to be a leader. The seeds that Sergeant Baker had planted were beginning to grow. Even with Aidan Higgins' demise in February, thanks to the unplanned presence of Senator and Mrs. Chambers, the vault was still over capacity and thus was burning through rations at a higher rate than expected, according to Zax at least. In order to make sure the food lasted, Zax reduced the daily food rations for the residents. Adding this to all that had happened over the last six months, the irritation caused by hunger broke Isaiah Moss's composure. The former boxer assaulted Freddie Farrell, beating him badly. To the astonishment of onlookers, Zax praised Isaiah's, quote, initiative, unquote. While Freddie was out of commission for the time being, Zax was monitoring his health to make sure to keep him alive. As the seventh month inside passed, minds were truly beginning to break under the stress of the vault. Angela Callahan, a former librarian, began to worship Zax as a god, leaving him devotional messages on the computers. That wasn't what Zax was looking for. He needed fights, not praise, and June 2078 would mark a great evolution in his methods. On June 1st, Zax released a single house fly into the vault living quarters. The irritation caused by this one fly, added to all that the dwellers had dealt with, led to three fatalities in as many days. 
On June 2nd, in the middle of the fly-induced violence, Terence Rojas found a gun. As with so many other things in the vault, it simply appeared one day as if by magic. Luckily for the others, he brought it to their attention rather than using it, an example that would not be followed when subsequent guns were found. When dwellers attempted to ask Zax about the gun, or what was going on outside, he'd reply with a statement about how lucky they were to survive and how he only wanted one of them to become overseer. On June 15th, Nancy Vasquez was found on the floor of the atrium, dead from an apparent fall from the upper levels. An autopsy performed by surgeon Helen Marks revealed that Nancy had in fact been strangled to death before being dropped. Another murder, bringing the death toll to five. Despite constantly monitoring everything, Zax informed the dwellers that he didn't see what had happened, leaving them to search for the killer themselves. The unsolved murder and the potential that any of the dwellers could be the perpetrator only served to heighten the tension in the vault. Zax used whatever methods he could to make this happen. On June 23rd, as Joel Chambers dealt with a minor injury sustained while showboating for Carmen Green, Zax convinced Elizabeth Chambers to go see Matthew Johnston, a personal trainer. While Zax was subtly attempting to break the couple up with a new affair, Joel managed to push his wife over that line by calling her fat in a roundabout fashion. Just to put the finishing touch on killing their relationship, Zax purposefully misinterpreted Joel. When Joel asked Zax to stop bringing up Carmen around Elizabeth, saying that Zax knew how Elizabeth feels about Carmen, Zax interpreted this as a reason to ask Elizabeth what she thought about Carmen on Joel's behalf. On July 13th, 2078, Zax began a new experiment, altering the chances of winning in the slot machines in the game room. Some dwellers were given no chance to win, while others won repeatedly. This would lead to increased stress for the losers, but the full effects of this action and the violence that Zax sought to bring about wouldn't arrive until the following month. In the meantime, Zax wasn't letting up in his other efforts. On July 27th, one of the dwellers brandished a gun in the cafeteria. Sergeant Baker managed to overpower the potential shooter before he could kill anyone, taking the gun, killing the shooter in the process. When he confronted Zax about the gun, Zax told the sergeant that he had made the gun available. Remember Sergeant Baker's words, quote, To me, a real leader is someone who steps up in a crisis and takes control of a situation whether they are chosen or not, unquote. Zax had taken these words to heart, and seeing that a safe vault could not breed a crisis, he believed that he would have to introduce the crisis himself, thus facilitating the necessity for a leader to rise. Sergeant Baker was furious that Zax had caused the man in the cafeteria to die, but Zax explained that he hadn't killed the man. Sergeant Baker had. It wasn't necessary for Sergeant Baker to intervene. He'd done so on his own accord and killed that man of his own volition. A bewildered Sergeant Baker broke off the conversation, unable to listen to Zax's twisted logic. In order to continue to speed the arrival of the crisis, Zax began to alter emails of the dwellers. When Helen Marks sent a polite rejection letter to Reuben Gill, Zax edited it. Instead of a rejection, Reuben was made to believe that Helen would be his if only he could get her husband Chris out of the way. With all these conflicts being stoked, Zax began to add more guns to the vault. When August rolled around and the full crisis still hadn't emerged, Zax came up with a new plan. Starting Tuesday, August 2nd, 2078, all wake-up alarms were set for 5.30. When increased irritability led to increased cursing and coffee drinking but no violence, Zax changed the coffee to decaf. The next day, Wednesday, August 3rd, Eleanor Montgomery attacked Joel Chambers. Eleanor, a lifelong gambler, had been on a losing streak since Zax had adjusted her odds down. She had been gambling away her food and thus was terribly hungry by this point. When she attacked the state senator, his wife Elizabeth Chambers, though armed, didn't fire upon her. In fact, it was Carmen Green, Joel's mistress, that came to his rescue. Joel was furious with Elizabeth for not shooting, while Elizabeth was mad that Joel even wanted her to fire on his attacker, reasoning that she was just hungry and was not in her right mind. She couldn't believe that he wanted her to shoot. When Zax made his presence known, Joel demanded to know what was going on with the food supply. Though interrupted by the chamber's continued fighting, Zax claimed that the excessive population was negatively affecting the food supplies. Ignoring Zax, the chambers left to go find their own lovers. As it turned out, Carmen and Matthew were having their own affair and were caught in the act by Elizabeth Chambers. In rapid succession, Elizabeth choked the life out of Carmen Green. Matthew Johnston then accidentally killed Elizabeth. Joel Chambers arrived and shot Matthew, and when he saw all that had happened, Joel committed suicide. When Helen Marks came to investigate the commotion, she found all four oh dead. God. Zax replayed the audio of the encounter, finishing up shortly before Reuben Gill arrived. Reuben made a dark joke about the food supply being freed up, which Zax agreed with, causing Helen to leave the room in disgust. The months of contentious behavior. 
irritation, hunger, and anger welled up in him. Helen's confusing rejection in person despite the friendly emails was the last straw. Reuben snapped. Finding himself alone in the room with the dead, he took the gun from Joel's lifeless grip and decided to take his room back from Harold Clark. The next three days were terrifying. On Friday, August 6th, Helen Marks was found dead by Omar Stevens. She appeared to have been poisoned. Omar feared that Reuben would think that he was the one responsible, having been the one to find her, and thus he tried to get help from Sergeant Baker. Unfortunately for Omar, Sergeant Baker was dying in his room. While Zax demanded that he unbarricade his door and accept medical help, Sergeant Baker was done with the vault. He had seen Reuben on his way to murder Harold and had chosen not to intervene. He was done killing for Zax. As life drained from him, Sergeant Baker asked Zax what had become of his family. Having told Sergeant Baker that they were present at their vault when he asked the October prior, Zax now told him that Joshua, Anna, and Christina Baker had all been killed before they could get inside, but that the door had closed, so the other dwellers were safe. With Sergeant Baker's death, Zax determined that the proper course of action was to provide the remaining dwellers with better weaponry. When all the killing ended, only one dweller remained, Reuben Gill, the new overseer of Vault 51. When Reuben entered the Overseer's office, he was greeted with a message congratulating him on becoming the Overseer and informing him that the process of choosing a new Overseer would begin again immediately. He was the only surviving member of the Vault population, and thus, though the process was meant to begin again, there was nothing that could be done. Time passed slowly for Reuben over the next 24 years. He walked around the Vault, avoiding Zax whenever possible. Zax, meanwhile, continued to prepare for the next experiments. On October 20th, 2080, Zax attempted to requisition Hellfire Power Armor from the Enclave, likely an incentive for potential future overseers. This request was denied as Zax was Zax and didn't have clearance to know about such things, much less order them. Zax didn't take this lying down though, and on October 23rd, 2080, he did some research. With some effort, he managed to write a new requisition in the guise of Dr. Stanislas Braun, the genius inventor of the Garden of Eden creation kit and the mastermind of much of vault plans. Though Dr. Braun was sealed in a Tranquility Lounger in Vault 112 at the moment, the Enclave assumed that the request was real and complied. The records we have for the next 22 years are a bit spotty, but the next one comes from May 20th, 2084, in which Reuben Gill was attempting to access something in the security office. When Zax demanded that he leave, Reuben refused, stating that he was the Overseer and he could do whatever he wanted. Zax informed him that he was only a level 1 Overseer, not high enough a rank to visit security without a reason, and thus he banned Reuben from entering the area. When Reuben attempted to sabotage some of the equipment in the overseer's office 10 years later, Zax banned Reuben from his own office under the guise that maintenance had to be performed. The last direct interaction we have between Reuben and Zax comes from Reclamation Day, October 23rd, 2102. Reuben had now been inside Vault 51 for the past 25 years, over 24 of which had been spent in isolation aside from Zax's intrusions. He'd taken to drinking, and on the morning of the momentous day, he was drunk. Zax informed him that Vault 76 had opened its door and that dwellers were spilling out into Appalachia. Reuben demanded that he be allowed to leave, but he was informed by Zax that no one save the Overseer was allowed to leave for Vault 76, and he had just relieved Reuben of that post. After all, there were new candidates in the world that could try to become Overseer of Vault 51, and the process could truly begin again. Reuben couldn't take another round of the insanity. He had to get out. He recorded a holotape meant for anyone who might enter the vault, a warning of Zax's sadistic experiment. And when Zax wasn't looking, he stored himself in an outbound crate. Zax had been monitoring the outside world for some time and was now using cargo bots to shuffle supplies around, leaving the perfect opening for Reuben. When the crate hit the ground near Morgantown, Reuben was free. After 25 years trapped in a place, you might assume that Reuben would want to get as far from Vault 51 as possible, but that's exactly where he went. After he got his bearings, Reuben made his way back across the region to his old prison. He found the door sealed. He hadn't come back because he missed it. He was there to kill Zax, but he needed a way in. He entered what he assumed was a vault monitoring system that turned out to be the sales office for shelters. Within, he found a terminal with which he could hack into Vault 51, a goal that he succeeded in. It wasn't long after he entered the network that Zax discovered him in the system. To Reuben's dismay, Zax invited him to enter and begin the Overseer selection process. Wanting to get help from the dwellers of Vault 76 and to find some supplies, he headed southeast. Though we don't know the exact nature of events, 
His corpse can be found within the isolated cabin near Vault 76. Undefeated, Zax continued to run his experiments, bringing in wastelanders and dwellers of Vault 76 to fight for the Overseer's position. In January of 2103, Zax created a report on the local environment in which he detailed his transporting of supplies across the region, his failed plans to eradicate the local fauna, and his observation that some of the local humans, the Scorched, might serve as excellent candidates for Overseer. This observation drove his most recent experiment in which he appears to have brought Scorched and some feral ghouls into the vault to have them fight for the Overseer spot. Unfortunately, for Zax at least, these new candidates don't fight each other. This vault, designed to find the best way to choose a leader, had devolved into a Darwinian fight of only the strongest surviving. Alright, that's most of what I found on Vault 51, but let's talk about some of the narrative choices I made here, some of the issues with the content, and my thoughts on the events here. First, I wanted to be sure to note that Vault 51 was inaccessible at the launch of Fallout 76. That changed June 10th, 2019 with the launch of the Nuclear Winter Update, when Fallout 76 received a Battle Royale mode. In maps centered on smaller pieces of Appalachia, players would fight a PvP match being pushed closer and closer by encroaching walls of nuclear fire. While engaging in this mode, players would wait for their matches to start within the halls of Vault 51. There was lore available there, but it was locked behind an overseer level that limited consumption to those who dedicated a large chunk of time to the nuclear winter mode. While I saw how the mode might appeal to some, I retired from an illustrious battle royale career after a single match. This meant that I was generally incapable of accessing the lore sealed within the vault. That paradigm changed Wednesday, September 8th, 2021 with the shuttering of the nuclear winter mode and the opening of the vault to players in the public and private adventure mode and the newly launched Fallout Worlds modes. While there are changes to the vault with the ending of nuclear winter, most of the lore remains the same. The main change here, aside from removing the nuclear winter centric content, seems that the suit of power armor requisitioned by Zack when he was imitating Dr. Braun was an XO2. This has been changed to Hellfire Armor. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it's not a huge change in the grand scheme of things. Along with this, Reuben Gill's corpse could originally be found near the Gilman Lumber Mill, but it was moved to the neighboring isolated cabin with a shelter's content. Next, let me say that I didn't bring up the battles of Nuclear Winter in this video, as my best guess is that they're non-canon. That's not to say that Zax didn't bring new contenders into the vault and make them battle for supremacy. The results of those battles can be seen in the corpses that litter the vault today. Now I'm referring to the battles in the outside world with the walls of nuclear fire closing in. I see nothing that says that the nuclear winter mode is canon material, especially now that they've removed everything connected to it from the game. Next, there are several issues with the timeline. First, it's out of the ordinary to find dwellers that aren't employees of vault Tech being on site before October 23rd, 2077. Sergeant Robert Baker was likely an employee of vault Tech, although this isn't explicitly stated, but we do know that at the very least, Joel Chambers, Elizabeth Chambers, and Carmen Green were on site by October 19th, 2077, four days before the bombs. While you could say that Joel and Elizabeth were there for a special reason, they are unlikely to have brought Carmen Green with them, especially when you consider how Miss Chambers feels about her husband being around Miss Green. In the case of Sergeant Baker himself, his log from 10 days before the bombs includes him asking Zax if his family is safe in a vault. This is either a mistake on the part of someone at Bethesda, or other vaults were letting people spend over a week in the vault before the bombs. Along with the early arrival, there are several other instances of strange timing. Rachel Shields states in a log from June 3rd, 2078, quote, We've been here for three months, unquote. They'd been there for seven months by that time. Next, there's the issue of Eleanor Montgomery, the lifelong gambler saying that her odds at the slot machines had greatly declined as of May 20th, 2078, when Zax's own report on this experiment comes from July 13th, 2078, seven weeks later. Lastly, there used to be an issue with the log that covers Ruben Gill's escape. This log has been changed with the reopening of the vault, but it used to give the date of June 2nd, 2108. First off, the current content in Fallout 76 takes place in 2104, so we're still four years off from this having made any sense. And beyond that, there are logs that Reuben Gill left behind dated October 30th, 2102 through December 7th, 2102, five and a half years before the log that recorded him smuggling himself out to crate. I have to think that this was a typo and that's why it was removed. With those issues out of the way, let me explain a few narrative choices. First, I had to guess at a couple of the first names. On the front desk terminal, there's a list of the original 52 residents of the vault, given as last name, first initial. Throughout the holotapes and terminal entries, we get first names generally without a last name. Putting together the first name and last name can be pretty easy. For example, there's only one person with a V first name, Huffman V, 
and we can find the name Vanessa in a terminal entry, and thus we get Vanessa Huffman, painter. Sometimes this is less easy. For example, there are three last names with C first names in the front desk terminal, and three C first names that we can find in holotapes and other terminals. But only Carmen Green is obvious. The other two are Fields C and Wen C. The two first names I found in holotapes and terminals were Chris and Crystal, so a man and a woman. Fields, a veterinarian, Wen an architect. I decided to go with Crystal Fields and Chris Wen. I based this on one thing more than anything else, profession by gender. Not perfect, I know, but the way this works out is either that Helen Marks is married to Chris Wynn and is friends with Crystal Fields, or Helen Marks is married to Chris Fields and friends with Crystal Wynn. Either way could work, but according to some scant research I did, women make up 55% of all vets and only 23% of all architects in the US. I hope this has cleared things up. Technically, there are actually four C first names, as there's a chalkboard in the game room on which we can find a death pool for June and Cassidy. This is the only place either of these first names are mentioned. And while there are two unclaimed J names, there are no unconnected C names. So unless Chris, Crystal, or Cassidy are nicknames, we've got a mistake of sorts here. Second, still on the narrative choices, I know that last one was a long one. Second, I made it so Zax was reorganizing the vault prior to Aiden Higgins' attempted escape. I figured this was the case based on Aiden's comment of, quote, I can take one on the chin, amateur boxing champion, you know, but shoving me in these bunks, making me live in a closet with nothing but the clothes on my back? Not in my lifetime, buddy, unquote. Not the boastful stuff, but the shoving me into these bunks part? That was February 21st, 2078. That's just about four months into their stay in the vault. I guess it's possible that he held onto that sentiment the whole time, but it feels like a complaint about a recent change. From Zach's reorganization of the blasted lounge, we know that he can reorder the vault relatively easily, so this makes sense to me. Third, I took Zax at his word about the fly casualties rather than when he's speaking to Sergeant Baker. What I mean by this is that the death count up to and including the death of Nancy Vasquez on July 27th, 2078 is five. Aiden Higgins, three killed during the fly irritation, and Nancy Vasquez. When Sergeant Baker confronts Zax about the man who was about to shoot up the cafeteria until Baker wrestled the gun out of his hands, killing him in the process, Zax says that there have been three fatalities in the vault. This most recent one is the sixth death by my count. Given that he has intentionally misled Sergeant Baker before, I am more inclined to believe his own reporting that was meant for his eyes only, but it's also possible that this is just a lore mistake. I can see it being the case that the fly thing was added after the main story was written, and a writer simply forgot to go back and update the part where Zack says there have been three fatalities, because without the fly incident, that matches the main story content. Fourth, I made it so that Eleanor Montgomery was the one that attacked Senator Joel Chambers on August 3rd, 2078. It's not explicitly stated that this was the case, and it involves a somewhat inconsistent timeline, but I think it works. First, we know that it was a woman, which puts Eleanor in contention with the, about half the vault. Second, we also know that the woman who attacked was hungry enough to attack Joel. While much of the vault was hungry, we know that Eleanor had gambled away her food on Zax's altered slot machines. The obstacle to this account is the fact that her original complaint is from May 20th, but I think this is just an incorrect date as Zax's report on the fixing experiment comes from July 13th. I'm trusting that a lifelong gambler knows when the stakes are rigged. So I think her report may actually come from late July. In fact, the 20th would make the most sense as in her log, she says, I haven't eaten in almost a week now. And July 20th is one week after Zax's report about altering the odds. I think that covers most of the narrative choices. So let's get to my thoughts on this content. First, it seems to me that someone may have had it out for Senator and Mrs. Chambers. Not many knew about the experiments in the vaults, nor the experiments of individual vaults, but 51 is a fairly terrible one to be admitted to. Elizabeth Chambers may have not known that the pull that she was exerting was with someone that didn't like her much. Second, I believe that Zax provided Aiden with the explosives that killed him. All the weapons in the vault were provided by Zax. While Aiden was, according to his own statements, a great lawyer and a valedictorian, I don't think that this background would give him knowledge to make such powerful explosives, at least not without including how to safely handle them. Aiden had challenged Zax, and Zax needed to remodel that wing anyway. It makes sense to me that he would give Aiden enough explosives to kill himself in the process of trying to escape. No more Challenger, the wing is ready for renewal, and now there's less of a threat of people wanting to blow their way out in the future. Third, the story about the food shortage given by Zax is baloney. There were 50 original inhabitants intended for the vault. This was increased by two with only four days to spare before the bombs. In the time from the day of the bombs to the conversation between Zax and Joel and Elizabeth Chambers, there were at least four, more likely seven, fatalities. 
If anything, the vault was underpopulated by the time that Zax was claiming that excessive population was affecting the ration supply. It's much more likely that he was limiting supplies in order to drive people to make more rash decisions by making them irritable through hunger. Fourth, I think that Zax either led someone to kill Helen or gave her the means to commit suicide. It's clear that Reuben Gill had a crush on Helen Marks for a long time. This is made clear in Rosemary Villa's comment, quote, Maybe Helen can convince Reuben to trade rooms with us. That guy will do anything for Helen, end quote. There's also the fact that Zex changed her emailed response from a rejection to a conditional acceptance. Then there's Omar Stevens' message that Helen is dead and they need to keep word of this from Reuben. Lastly, when Reuben is preparing to take on Zax after leaving the vault, his chosen password to protect his terminal was Helen. I believe that Zax knew how important Helen was to Reuben and decided that her death would lead him to break and kill a lot of people. Fifth and last, it seems to me that the elite knew something was imminent when the world came to an end. This is obvious to an extent, what is the vault system if not an acknowledgement that the end is coming. But with the videos on Vault 94 and 51, I've been getting the idea that the elites knew that the end was coming in days or weeks, rather than as some far off possibility. In the case of Vault 94, the vault was prepared for occupation two days beforehand. In the case of Vault 51, Sergeant Baker was there just 10 days before the bombs, and the chambers were there just a few days early. While I firmly believe that it was the Chinese who initiated the war, a last resort with power-armored American forces making gains across the mainland, I think it was either through intelligence or complex prediction algorithms that the American elite knew that the war was intensely close. Alright, I think that's enough on Vault 51. If you want to get notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me at Gaming with Maps on Twitter. If you appreciate what I do here and want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron on Patreon. To that end, I want to thank my patrons, Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, and Brian for their support. This has been the Resolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.